Hello and welcome back to cryptography. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you all about the concept known as symmetric encryption. So symmetric encryption has the following scheme to it. We take some plain text, we throw it through an encryption function along with a key, and this produces some ciphertext. Uh, on the other hand, we can take some ciphertext along with the key, throw it through a decryption function, and result in the plain text. So one method of doing this is what's known as a one-time pad. So in order to perform encryption, we randomly generate some key, a bunch of random ones and zeros with equal probability that each bit is a zero or one. We then go on to XOR each bit of the plain text with the key, which implies that there's an equal probability based on the way that XOR works that each bit is flipped. In doing so, you've entirely mangled up the data because each bit of your original data has equal probability that it was flipped or not flipped. And in doing so, you've, assuming maximal entropy in that key with each prob equal probability that each bit is a zero or one, now you have equal probability also that each bit of the ciphertext is a zero or one because each bit may have been flipped or not flipped. So this is completely going to garble the message from plain text to ciphertext. The ciphertext without that key is completely unintelligible. So decryption actually works the same way. Um, again, you just XOR each bit of the ciphertext with a key. And the reason that this works, this protocol is very simple, is that XOR is its own inverse. So if we have some A XOR B XOR B, that is the same thing as a XOR B XOR B, where we're kind of using the associative property to move these parentheses around, right? And then that's the same thing as A XOR 0, because B XOR B is just 0. If you XOR something with itself, it becomes a 0. And A XOR 0 is just A, because anything XORed with 0 is just A. It's just its original self. So what that means is that in order to encrypt, we just XOR with the key. And in order to decrypt, we just, again, XOR with the key. Okay, so let's kind of look in the paradigm of this encryption scheme, what this looks like, right? We have some message uh, in plain text called, let's say, or that has the data, hello world. And it has a, we can kind of break this down into its bit string, right? A bunch of just ones and zeros in a row. You know, we interpret all of this data as ASCII converted into... Uh, or view it then as kind of this bit string, and we have this key. We'll just, in this case, we didn't kind of do it correctly, um, where quote unquote correctly is just truly random data for that key. In this case, we're just using a passphrase, um, which works to some extent, but has its own issues. Really, what you want to do is do complete random data for that key. But in this case, we just have the message super secret as our key. And when we go through and XOR it together, we can see on the right, we have the ciphertext that is largely a bunch of just random bytes. So some of them will be ASCII characters. You I mean, could be interpreted as ASCII characters. Some of them won't. It's just going to be completely random data, and the recipient, without that key, is not going to be able to recover it. Okay. Uh, and again, if we want to return back to that plain text, uh, we just need to XOR again with the key. So we XOR the ciphertext with the key and we return back to the plain text. So this uh, protocol works very well as long as each um, participant of the communication has that long key. And when I say long key, I, I guess I specifically mean the length of the key must be the length of the plain text or potentially longer. You could do shorter, but that means you're going to start repeating yourself as if that was the, the scheme that you would use. You could imagine, for example, some three byte key and you could just keep reusing the key, um, repeating it until you get through everything. But really to do a one-time pad correctly and not end up with a bunch of issues because it turns out if you start repeating the key, you could start doing like this frequency analysis stuff on it that allows you to decrypt. If you want true secrecy with this one-time pad, you need a bunch of random bytes that is as long as the plain text, or at least as long as the plain text, and then you go through an XOR with that. And the problem with that is that if I have some host A and some host B, I have Alice and Bob, let's say, and I want to be able to securely communicate with Bob as Alice to send this hello world message, somehow I have to get the key to Bob first, right? And the, this key is going to be just as long 
as the original message. So if I could securely get the key somehow, I mean, that kind of implies likely that I could securely get the plain text. Now, there's schemes where it would in fact work. So for example, if we have some secure channel of transferring data momentarily, let's say Alice and Bob meet up somewhere and exchange a key to be used later, this would of course work. But if they just want to suddenly make secure communication happen, uh, secure encrypted communication happen without some prior secure communication channel, such as meeting up in person, uh, this isn't going to work because if we could transfer the key, then we could just transfer the plain text. It's kind of a chicken and egg problem because this key is just as long as the plain text. It doesn't really make sense. Now, before we dive a little bit deeper into that problem, let's look at some of the properties that we're interested in with encryption. So the first property that we're interested in is called confusion, which basically means that each bit of the ciphertext depends on several parts of the key, obscuring the connection between the two. So this becomes highly relevant if, for example, you're going to start doing encryption with shorter length keys, as we'll see in a little bit. Uh, well, if we start doing encryption with shorter length keys, we need to ideally have it be the case that if I have some ciphertext and I want to um, produce this ciphertext from my key, right, that we don't want similar keys to produce uh, similar ciphertext. We want a small change in the key to have this avalanche effect onto the ciphertext. We want it to very aggressively mangle the ciphertext if we just ever so slightly change the key. That's kind of the concept of confusion is that there's an avalanche result of just slightly changing the key, it will dramatically change the ciphertext. Diffusion is very similar, um, but kind of from the perspective of a small change in the plain text. So it, diffusion says, a change in a single bit of plain text produces a change in about half the bits of the ciphertext. So in other words, if we just slightly change the plain text, we also need the ciphertext to completely change. So both of these properties mean that a small difference in plain text completely changes the ciphertext, and a small change in the key completely changes the ciphertext. So the ciphertext is very... Uh, mutated and manipulated as a function of both the plain text and the ciphertext. There's no statistical correlation that can be found or some algebraic equation that can be discovered relating the plain text to the ciphertext or the key to the ciphertext, where if you could just slightly change the key or just slightly change the plain text, that the ciphertext is only just slightly changed. We want it to be dramatically changed in this aval avalanche effect way. Okay, so a Encryption standard, called Advanced Encryption Standard, very, very cool name, or more commonly called AES, is a scheme that has exactly these properties. So we have some key. Um, we kind of convert this key into these round key things and do XORs with the plain text to, or really not the plain text, the state of the algorithm at some point in time to produce a new state. And then we do this substitution and then we shift the rows because we're kind of pretending this data is a matrix or treating this data as a matrix. And then we mix up the columns a bit. We kind of basically just have this mathematical blender of a function that takes the key, takes the plain text and produces some ciphertext. How it is that this really works isn't uh, super critical. Really, the way to think about it is it is just kind of this mathematical blender that achieves these previously discussed properties of confusion and diffusion. And we'll say for now, a bunch of mathematicians have really looked at it, a bunch of cryptographers have really looked at it and kind of given it the golden stamp of approval saying, yeah, this, uh, this really mangles the data. We'll say, we'll say that for now. Uh, that is kind of what AES is. You can kind of treat it as this black box thing that achieves these properties of confusion and diffusion. Okay, so again, we're, we've got an encryption protocol. So we take some plain text, we throw it through the AES function along with the key, it produces ciphertext. Similarly, we can do decryption. We take our ciphertext along with the key, throw it through the AES decryption function, and we result in some plain text. 
So this advanced encryption standard, AES, has uh, some properties or some facts about it that are kind of important to keep in mind. Um, the first one is that it's this substitution permutation network. That is kind of the type of cryptographic encryption um, under the hood, what's going on is it's known as a substitution permutation network. As we saw before, right, we're substituting data when we're kind of, uh, well, let's go back to that slide. When we do this substitute bytes step over on the right, and then we're also um, permuting it with these shifting and mixing of columns, right? We've got this, it's, it's known commonly as a substitution permutation network. And we've also got um, some properties about the key and what's known as the block size. So the key size is one of 128 bits, 192 or 256 bits. So this is commonly referred to as AES-128, AES-192 and AES-256. So that kind of dictates how long the key is. So whereas with a one-time pad, we had this key that ideally was the same length as our plain text. Um, in this case, we have a very exact size that the key is and it's, regardless of what the size of your data is, that this key will be exactly this long. Okay, and then we also have what's known as the block size. And the block size has to do with when we send data through this encryption uh, scheme, we can encrypt exactly 128 bits of plain text to produce exactly 128 bits of cipher text. So it works in exactly these 16 byte chunks when it does its encryption scheme. So let's look a little bit more at this concept of a block of data being encrypted to kind of understand that a little bit better. So in this case we're trying to encrypt the message hello world and we want to throw it through our encryption function to produce some ciphertext. And we've got this block cipher, we've got this block encryption scheme and you can think of AES right as one of those. And when we go through to send this through and if it's a 16 byte block size or 128 bit block size I try and send this message here that's 13 bytes long. It's not going to work. We can't encrypt this because as we said, this encryption function works on exactly its block size or in the example of AES, 128 bits or 16 bytes. And this is 13 bytes. We can't encrypt 13 bytes. We can only encrypt 16 bytes. So this is no good. Now probably the obvious solution to this problem is okay, just pad it with some null bytes then, right? Just throw some null bytes at the end, let's encrypt it. We're up at 16 bytes now, we're good to go. We got ciphertext. Well, this is a problem uh, because when we go and decrypt it, uh, we successfully decrypt, we get these null bytes at the end uh, to pad that data out. The person decrypting with these null bytes here doesn't necessarily know how many bytes of null bytes were padded onto the end, right? When you go to decrypt this, we don't know, maybe those three null bytes were intentionally part of the data. Maybe we in fact were trying to transfer hello world with three null bytes at the end, or maybe just one null byte at the end. We're not really sure. This is kind of a problem. Now there's a very simple solution as well to this problem. And what the solution is to that problem is what's known as PKC number seven. So PKC seven. Uh, and what the solution is, is to just append how many bytes of padding are to the end. So rather than appending three null bytes, we append three three bytes to the end. So we have 0, 03003003 0, 03, 0, 03 as hex, as we can see. And again, this puts us up to 16 bytes, so we can encrypt it no problem. We're working on 128 bits at a time, 16 bytes, and we've got three bytes of padding. And we just say that very explicitly at the end using this PKC7 standard saying 333 three, three, because we've got three bytes of padding at the end. And now when we go to decrypt it, we're going to be able to analyze this text. We're going to see this 333 three, three at the end. We're gonna know there's three bytes of padding and we are going to take that away and successfully return to the original plain text. Okay. So there's one other thing that we have to deal with. Again, right, we said we work on exactly these 128-bit blocks in the case of AES or 16 bytes. Well, what if we want to send more? In this case, right, we've got hello world, hello world twice, which would be uh, 26 bytes of data. And in this case, we're going to um, pad that out to be a multiple of 16 bytes. So we're going to append an extra six bytes, right? We've got 13 times two, 26 bytes, plus another six bytes to get up to 32 bytes, which is a multiple of 16. So we pad on these 060606 at the end. And now we've got kind of 
a multiple of 16 bytes, but we said that our encryption function works on exactly 16 bytes of data. So this is a problem. It's, again, very easily solvable, but this is an important thing to keep in mind, that these encryption functions work on exactly 16 bytes of data in the case of AES with a 128-bit block size. And what we do is we just split it apart. The simple solution to this problem is to just take the first 16 bytes, encrypt that, produce some ciphertext, go through, take the second 16 bytes, throw that through the encryption function, get some ciphertext. And now we've kind of just got these two encrypted blocks next to each other, um, and it's totally fine, right? We just send the, the first block encrypted, the second block encrypted, and we've got our uh, ciphertext that now would be 32 bytes, and then we could do the exact reverse and get that plain text back as well. Now, what this is known as in doing this method of kind of just encrypting each piece block by block is what's known as the electronic code book, ECB, is what it's commonly referred to as. And as we said, right, we just take our 16 bytes, we encrypt it, we get our 16 bytes of ciphertext, we do this again on the next 16 byte block and then the next 16 byte block until we've done all of our 16 byte blocks. And the decryption is very simple, right? We just do the reverse. We just throw the ciphertext through with the key, we get the plain text, etc., etc. This is what's known as ECB mode of encryption. Now there's a problem with ECB. So this is kind of the famous uh, cryptographic penguin image that uh, kind of shows up in a lot of cryptography contexts that talk about this ECB mode. And what the problem is, is if we have a bunch of bits of data that are repeated all over the place. So in this case, we can see, for example, we have a lot of white pixels, a lot of black pixels, a lot of yellow pixels. If we have all these chunks and we kind of group these into 16 byte chunks and we encrypt it, we're going to see this pattern repeated over and over, right? This entire top row of pixels, of white pixels, let's say, is just gonna keep repeating itself over and over and over and we're gonna be able to see a pattern in this data, right? We're gonna see that the ciphertext has a lot of repeated blocks. And the goal of encryption is to make uh, this data not reveal itself in any way, right? We don't, so even though you might not necessarily know what that original blob of data was, you're gonna be able to see a pattern in the data and see at what frequency it's repeated and what intervals and what pattern it's repeated. And this just alone can infer a lot of information about the data. So for example, if we're encrypting this picture of a penguin, we can actually make out the fact that we encrypted a picture of a penguin. Now we're not gonna know exactly the colors or exactly what that image looks like, but this is enough data by just having this pattern with these repeated blocks to just recover the fact that, hey, what was sent is a penguin. And this, this is a massive problem. There's a solution to this problem. And the solution to this problem, it is what's known as the cipher block chaining mode of encryption. And what we do here is we kind of chain all of these encryption blocks together. So we don't just go from plain text to cipher text and do this kind of an isolated chunks. Instead, we do, um, we take that previous ciphertext, so if we go on to block number two, let's say, we take the previous block ciphertext, we XOR that with the plain text, and then we send that through. And we keep doing this over and over and over again, and we kind of just undo the exact same thing uh, in order to recover the uh, plain text when we go to decrypt. And again, we also have this, what's called an initialization vector, which is just, in this case, if we're working with 16 uh, byte blocks, we just have 16 random bytes that also needs to be included with the encrypted data to kind of declare what the initialization vector is. Um, and we just use that as our initial XOR as kind of our pseudo previous ciphertext for that first block. But anyways, we, we chain all of these blocks together. And now when we go through and we encrypt the penguin, it is securely uh, and patternlessly encrypted because by chaining all of these blocks together, we don't just have isolated blocks being uh, encrypted each time to produce this pattern. It's all linked together in a way that just completely garbles the data. Now, there is one problem with this, and it has to do with performance. So you might not necessarily care about performance if we're just strictly talking about cryptography, but fortunately, there's this often this trade-off in uh, security of security versus performance. And if we think back to this algorithm, right, 
if we want to, in parallel, encrypt this massive blob of data, imagine we have tens or hundreds or millions of blocks of data that we want to encrypt. Well, we have to wait for the previous one to be encrypted before we can encrypt the next one. And this is kind of a problem. We didn't actually have that with ECB mode because each block could be independently encrypted. And so we could just paralyze out that entire process, you know, if we have hundreds of cores to really do this aggressive encryption quickly, uh, we could do them all in parallel. But in this case, we have to do them all sequentially. So this is a little bit unfortunate, depending on the application and depending on how much data we want to encrypt and what kind of the properties are of our specific program that requires this encryption. There's kind of this downfall of performance. So there is another mode, and in fact, there's several modes, but one more we'll take a look at is what's known as the counter mode. And the counter mode kind of solves um, both problems in some sense, in that we take a initial random value as our kind of where to start our counter at, let's say, and we encrypt that, and then we add one to that, and we encrypt that, and we add one to that, and we encrypt that. So we just have a bunch of sequential pieces of numbers, right? Basically just this counter going up, and we encrypt all of those, and then we just XOR uh, our plain text with the result of that encrypted number to produce our ciphertext. So we can do this all in parallel because we can just split up the where the counter is going to be for all the, the cores, let's say, doing this encryption. And in doing so, we kind of convert a block cipher like AES into uh, what's known as a stream cipher, so something more similar to a one-time pad where we're just really abusing the fact that we want to XOR some random data with our plain text to produce the ciphertext. And we're just converting AES uh, into this capability where we can convert a bunch of data starting somewhere uh, encrypted with this key and you use that to produce just a random key, kind of like a little random subchunk of a key for our one-time pad in some sense. And so this, this kind of solves that problem and allows us to um, perform this encryption in parallel, but also not have all of these blocks potentially being related to each other and kind of achieve something very similar to a one-time pad by doing this mode. So as I said, there's a lot of other modes and kind of the mode you want to use maybe depends on the characteristics of your program, what you're kind of after. Um, but this is one solution to kind of overcoming the parallel problem and the uh, frequency repeating pattern problem.